Well, welcome back as we look at the next passage in our God is series. And in this section in Isaiah 6, we're looking at um, God is glorious. Um, as always, I'll be working my way through the passage. But what I encourage you to do is take some time to read the passage a few times, familiarize yourself with it, and spend some time praying. Ask God to help you to understand his word, that his spirit would take these truths and write them in your heart. And I'm going to now highlight just a few of the things that I've seen as I work through this passage. The way the passage is written, uh, we can pick up just a little bit of the, the structure, the flow of what's happening here. So Isaiah sets this whole story in history. So it's in the year that King Uzziah died. Um, from the history books, we, we know that this was around about 740 BC. Um, but the key here is not that King Uzziah is dying. As Isaiah is just using that, that event in history to root this in an event that was much more significant for Isaiah. Because in that year, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. And this seeing the Lord changed Isaiah's life forever. In the flow of the passage, we can just pick up a little bit of a structure um, in that we're told in these first few verses what Isaiah saw. Then we see his um, response to that. And then we've got these two words, then and then which just, again, help us to see the flow of the passage. We'll uh, look at this together. In this first section, Isaiah sees the king in his holiness. So in this section, Isaiah is doing his best to describe the indescribable. Isaiah sees the Lord He's high and exalted, seated on a throne. So this is a king. King Uzziah may be dying, but there is a greater king sitting on his throne. The train of his robe filling the temple. Um, just get it, giving this picture of the immensity of God. He's filling this huge space. And then above him are these seraphim, which uh, literally are are beings made of fire is a direct translation so and these superhuman um, heavenly beings are there in the throne room of heaven um, it's hard for us to imagine exactly how they look but they've got six wings covering their faces and their feet and flying and the key here is what they are saying holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah gets this picture of the king in his holiness. This is the only time in the Bible that um, any attribute of God is mentioned three times in succession. And this holiness implies a, an absolute moral purity and separateness from the creation. And these seraphim crying out, holy, 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 is saying perfection, perfection, perfection. God is absolutely different from anything else in all of creation. The whole earth is full of his glory. Glory is the word that the Bible uses for God. When God displays his greatness, um, when he reveals that so people can see it, the only word that can really capture God in his greatness is this word glory. And this picture is immense. So God himself is seated mightily on the throne, filling the temple. These seraphim are there saying these great words and the sound of their voices is causing the whole temple to shake. And the temple is filled with smoke. Um, when we see this idea in the Old Testament, you see on Mount Sinai, there's kind of clouds covering the mountain and lightning and looks like the mountain is on fire. And when the tabernacle 
and the temple were filled with God's glory. We're also told that they were filled with smoke. People couldn't approach. So this is a picture of the almighty, holy, glorious God with his people. And the picture is meant to to bring a sense of awe to us. These, as we said, seraphim, which are superhuman, perfect beings in God's presence. That's the only way they can be in God's presence, that they are sinless. But even they have to cover their faces and cover their feet. They are humbling themselves before the glory of God, this holy, holy, holy God who is so much greater than them. And the idea here is that if you, if any of us, were to see God in his glory, it would impact us in a massive, massive way. And that's what we see happening in these next few verses, where Isaiah sees God and he is broken. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. You see, to see God in his absolute holiness highlights that we are unholy. That's what it did for Isaiah. I am a man of unclean lips. I'm unclean, unholy, unfit for God. But now my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You see, seeing the Holy, Holy Lord Almighty, I saw the Lord I've seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah is showing us that seeing the Lord in his mighty glory left him broken. It humbled him. Woe to me, I am ruined. It is done. I I cannot carry on living. See, that's what seeing God in his holiness actually does. It, It highlights for us Uh, the sinfulness of sin, our uncleanness, the fact that we live among unclean people and we ourselves are unclean and to see God in his holiness ends up breaking us. I am ruined. Thankfully though, Isaiah doesn't only get a picture of God in his glorious holiness. These next few verses um, show how God doesn't reveal himself in order to destroy us, but rather he reveals himself to Isaiah in order to heal him. This king in his holiness, the sight of him takes Isaiah to a point of brokenness, but then God heals him. Um, This holy, holy, holy God in his presence is... An altar. An altar is a place of sacrifice. And the seraphim comes and takes a live coal from this altar. Um, He takes it with tongs. Now, the important thing is, remember, this is a being made of fire. He didn't take this with tongs because it's a hot thing. He took it with tongs because it is a holy thing. It is on the altar, a holy offering to God. And this holy offering does something absolutely amazing. This is, in many ways, the climax of this passage. See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This holy thing touches Isaiah's unclean lips and it does the unimaginable. It cleans him. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And this has touched your lips. And instead of hurting him, it heals him. It heals him in the greatest sense of that word. Your guilt is taken away. It is gone. Your sin atoned for. The price has been paid. See, coming into the presence of this holy, holy God broke Isaiah. He realized the sinfulness of his own sin. But then wonderfully we get this reality that this holy God is able to heal. He's able to deal with 
guilt. Take it away. He's able to atone for sin. And what Isaiah is given here is a picture 700 odd years before Jesus came. So as we look at this altar, we know that a sacrifice was made on that altar. One that could take guilt away and atone for sin. Isaiah was given a picture of Jesus' death. It's only Jesus' sacrifice that could do what happens here in Isaiah 6. And this is a picture of what is possible for all of us. All of us, as we read God's word, get to behold the king in his holiness. As we realize this more and more, it should highlight we are not holy like God. We are sinful and that reality should break us. But thankfully, God doesn't reveal himself in order to destroy us, but rather to, to redeem us. This holy God has made sacrifice. His own son came in order to heal us, to take our guilt away and to atone for our sins. Isaiah could only look ahead to this. We get to look back. And the response that we see here from Isaiah is that he is awakened to live for God. And this is the response um, that the gospel calls for. When we behold God in his glorious holiness, when we see the sinfulness of sin, but then when we are healed, when we see the magnitude of the grace that we've been shown, the glorious grace that is ours through our Lord Jesus' death, the right response for us is to say, here I am, send me. Send me, Lord. I'm willing to do whatever is necessary. What we see in Isaiah, um, in, in chapters 1 to 5, we have seen um, the picture of Israel in spiritual failure. In chapters uh, 6 to 11, we see the awakening power of grace. But what we'll see the whole way through Isaiah is even though he says, um, here I am, send me. He goes to a people who don't actually want to hear the message. Their ears are closed, as we read on in Isaiah 6. Their eyes don't see. And so him saying, here I am, send me, isn't him going into an easy mission. He's going into a mission that's really hard. But because he's seen God in his holiness, because he's got a sense of his own brokenness and the, the brokenness, the uncleanness of the people he lives among, and then he's experienced the healing power of the gospel. He is willing to do absolutely anything. Here I am, Lord. Send me. And as we dig further into this passage, as you teach others this passage, as we get a sense for God's holiness and his great glory, it should do this to us too. It should break us at our own sin. It should make us marvel at the fact that we can be healed by God's glorious grace. And the more we grab hold of that, it should awaken us to say, Lord, I'm willing to do absolutely anything for you. Here I am, Lord. Send me. And so as you dig in further, I really pray that this would be a great encouragement for your own heart, that you would stand in awe of God and his glory. But then it would also stir you to want to be one who increasingly lives for him and for his glory. So God bless as you dig in further and as you teach this passage to others.